Hello, hello and welcome to today's live webcast, uh, a webcast on the future of antivirus. My name is John Stevenson from Deep Secure, and on behalf of all the team here, um, first of all, I have to say how delighted we are to have such a great attendance for this event. Uh, we're bowled over by what is in effect uh, a virtual full house for today's session. It's great news and I think if you pause and think about it for a second, it's also quite easy to see why. It's 35 years ago that the uh, early computer security viruses uh, were being used to infect, of all things, five and a quarter inch floppy disks. Yes, five and a quarter and floppy. And in that 35 years, you know, defences have evolved layer upon layer with ever greater ingenuity, really, uh, attempting to detect malware, um, find intruders, deal with data loss, um, and even, you know, record attacks. And yet malware, what's effectively the spearhead for all that criminal activity, malware continues to flourish and, and to proliferate. So we really wanted to use today's session to ask how come we've got to that point uh, and what does the future hold for antivirus? Now, I'm delighted to say that um, we've been joined today by what I can only describe as two leading lights in the cybersecurity industry to help us with that discussion, with that debate. First off, for the first part of the session, we're being joined by Mr. Graham Cluley, a name which I'm guessing will be familiar to many. Graham, of course, is uh, a world-renowned security blogger and author, uh, speaks at uh, events, conventions, uh, uh, and in media circles on the subject of cybersecurity, as well as having his own podcast. And indeed, I see, was, uh, was inducted into the Infosecurity Cybersecurity Hall of Fame not, not so long back. And Graham's job in part one of our session today is really scene setting. We'd like Graham to take a look at, at really how we've come to this point and, and what the contemporary malware landscape seems to, seems to appear to be, what it looks like. Then in section two, um, we're equally fortunate to have with us Deep Secure CTO, Dr. Simon Wiseman. Now, Simon's oh, over 30 years experience in the realm of cybersecurity, working with government and defense uh, and research agencies, looking at the problem of malware and looking at how best to defeat it. Uh, he's got some interesting opinions, some quite radical views uh, and some different technological approaches that he's going to table and share with us today. And table and share are the key words because uh, we'd like you to contribute to this session um, and you know flag your questions up for, for Graham and for Simon as, as we go through our webcast today and then we'll deal with them as we come to a close. If you look at your GoToWebinar uh, browser window or, or, or the GoToWebinar app, if you're using the app, there should be a little orange uh, Chevron pointing right. If you expand that up, open, there'll be a question pane or question panel there where you can submit your questions. And we'll be keeping an eye on that as we go along uh, and then rounding them up and dealing with them as we come to a close. OK, so that's the order of events for today. I hope you're going to enjoy our session. Uh, mm -hmm. And first off, and without further ado, I'm going to ask Graham to uh, take the stage for a minute and, and set the scene for us. Graham, one moment while I just share the um, control of the system with you. Okay, thank you very much uh, indeed, John. And it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, hello, everyone. And thanks to the great team at Deep Secure for inviting me to speak today. I've been working in the field of computer security since 1992, January 1992. I first got a paycheck from a security company. In fact, my very first job was as the chief Windows programmer of the very first edition 
of Dr. Solomon's antivirus toolkit. Now, Chief Windows Programmer sounds like a grand title, but the truth was I was the only Windows programmer. I was not only um, writing the code, oops, sorry, the clicker's gone crazy, not only writing the code, but it was even my job to design and draw the bitmap animations. It was a pretty scary assignment for someone fresh out of college in his first professional programming job, but not quite as terrifying as what happened a couple of months later because I appeared on John Craven's news round here in the UK, the, the kids news TV program, um, where they were reporting all about the legendary Michelangelo virus. that Some fellow called John McAfee claimed would affect six million PCs worldwide. I wonder whatever happened to him. Uh, yeah, that is a skinnier version of me there, pretending to type at a keyboard from the uh, Newsram program. It was a lot of fun working for an antivirus company in the old days. Malware back then wasn't designed to make money. It was electronic graffiti. While it was still undesirable, you, didn't, you definitely didn't want a virus infecting your computer. They were largely being written by teenage boys uh, to show off to each other. They certainly weren't stealing data or opening doors for hackers to gain unauthorized remote access to systems. And also, way back then, it was easier to be an expert in computer viruses too. So at the time, there were around about 200 new computer viruses a month, six or seven per day. And I used to do a party trick at trade exhibitions where I'd stand on the booth and ask people to shout out the name of a computer virus. And people would say, Frodo virus or stoned or Jerusalem. Uh, and I would tell them what the virus did. So, you know, Frodo virus had 4,096 bytes to the length of your files. And on one day in September, it displays a message saying Frodo lives and Jerusalem uh, adds 1,813 bytes to your com files. Um, uh, on, and then on Friday the 13th, it will delete those files. There's a bug in the virus, which means it keeps on adding the bug. All this kind of useless information remains in my head to this day. Well, those sort of tricks were possible back then, never helped me pull any girls. Uh, but not only was it possible because there were relatively few viruses, but also because it is possible for each virus to be analyzed by hand by a human to find out what it really did. It was, without doubt, a different age. Most of our customers received antivirus updates from us every three months. And the way in which we delivered, every three months, the way in which we delivered the updates was by sending them out via something like this. You show kids these today, they won't know what you're talking about. Um, we sent them out by post on a five and a quarter inch 360K floppy disk. That's how we got the latest antivirus updates to people every three months. Now, some firms, of course, were feeling a little bit paranoid. And they said, we don't want updates every three months. So for those people, we had to go down to the post box every month instead. And if there was a scare, if there was a virus outbreak or something had caught the media's attention, we could always fax an antivirus update to people. They would receive on their fax machine, you had to pay a lot more for this service, um, a printout which you could then type in by hand and that would protect your computers. We could even, in a real crisis, we could even read you an antivirus update over the phone. It contained a checksum to make sure that you typed it in properly. So we made that available too. To. But all the time we were being asked, how is your antivirus product going to cope when there are 10,000 viruses in total. Well, that day did come. Round about 10 years after the emergence of the very first virus in October 1996, we handed out a commemorative clock recognizing the existence of the 10,000th virus. Oh, and we also, round about that time, we stopped shipping on three and a half inch disks as well, which meant we could fit more antivirus definitions on. And when those filled up, we just added another disk to the envelope and another and another. Of course, our postal charges began to go up too. What we couldn't deny was that the amount of malware was certainly 
on the rise. And it's continued to rise ever since. What we're looking at right here are the figures, here they are, are the figures from AV test, which is an independent testing agency based in Germany. They're experts in testing security software. And they show that there is more than 10 times more malware in existence now than there was less than 10 years ago. So the increase has really been dramatic. In fact, there are now over 1.2 billion, with a B, pieces of malware in existence. So what does that mean? Well, it means we've gone from having six new pieces of malware every day when I joined this industry to a staggering 560,000. So when people say to me, oh, you know, six viruses per day, it's like today we get six viruses, you get six viruses every second of every day. That's how much it's sped up. In fact, if we were going to hand out a clock like we did before for people, imagine we reset the clock. Imagine we said, okay, viruses now exist at the current rate. We would commemorate 10,000 pieces of malware, not after 10 years, but actually after just 46 minutes. That's how long it would take us to get to 10,000 new computer viruses. So what I'm really saying here is there's a lot of new malware and it's coming out all the time. And as you know, most of it today is financially motivated. It's designed to steal from you or grant access to hackers who are going to plant spyware or ransomware on your computers. In short, there's an awful lot of malware out there, too much for humans to keep up with. And inevitably, there is malware that is hitting companies before it is ever seen by antivirus laboratories and antivirus experts. Now, antivirus companies, they recognize this fact as well, and they handle this, or they try to handle it, using a variety of different techniques like heuristics, behavioral analysis, these sort of things to detect brand new malware. But it can't find everything without creating a false alarm problem. Doesn't mean antivirus is worthless. It's still an, a, a valuable part of your defense, but it can't be your only defense. But this glut of malware, the sheer glut, the tidal wave of cybercrime is not the only problem. Another problem is that it's now easy for malicious hackers to create a piece of malware that your antivirus doesn't detect. Online services have made it really simple for the hackers to find out if their antivirus, if their, sorry, if their virus or piece of malware more specifically can get past your antivirus. There are services online that will run a piece of brandly, uh, brand new coded malware past scores of different antivirus products and tell the hacker which, if any, detected it. So hackers can alter their malware until it gets through, and only then do they launch it against you. That's the version of the malware they will use to try and attack you. They know it has a greater chance of success. Furthermore, malicious hackers have become experts at social engineering. They know that the typical computer user is much more likely to open or download an attached document than an executable file. And the reason for that is the way in which we work. We exchange data files all the time, spreadsheets and PowerPoint slides and PDFs and Word documents. We do that all the time in our jobs. You're much more likely to feel comfortable opening a file called mortgageapplication.doc then you are one called ransomware.exe. Or imagine you work in personnel or human resources. You'll have no qualms about opening a PDF or a Word document that claims to be a CV because you receive them all the time in that kind of format. And there lies a problem because data files today may not just be data. Take this Word document, for instance. It pretends to be an invoice, but it says the file has been 
protected by Microsoft Office. It's asking you to perform a function in order to unlock the file. It's going to ask you to press some buttons. But in reality, the Word document contains PowerShell code that will activate ransomware if you are fooled into doing this. Here's another one. On this occasion, what we're looking at here is a document uh, which is exploiting a zero day vulnerability in Microsoft Word. And it's doing that to infect computers with spyware. These messages are disguised to make it look as though they've been sent by your photocopier. Some modern photocopies these days, uh, uh, scanners and the like, they will actually send you a PDF uh, or a scan of the thing which you've put on the photocopy. So you receive it via email. The vulnerability enables malicious hackers to execute a visual basic script, which contains PowerShell commands when the user opens a Microsoft Office RTF document laden with that particular embedded exploit, squirreled away inside the code. And here in this one, the Word document pretends and presents what appears to be a garbled document. It looks like it's encrypted. It puts up this little banner. And what it wants you to do is it wants to trick unsuspecting recipients into enabling macros to decrypt and view the content. And many people will. And they think what they've received is a secure communication, but it isn't. The reality is that hackers are writing bespoke malware to target companies like yours, all the better to slip past your regular anti malware defenses. And it's typically entering your organization as a data file. So let's look at a scenario uh, of exactly how that can happen. Here we've got a chap. Uh, imagine he is the chief financial officer working at a company. He's got a couple of kids and he sends these kids to school. Okay, There they go, going to school. Marvellous. Now, if he's anything like me, he's finding a bit of a nightmare to remember all the other parents' names and the other kids' names at drop off and pick up and all the rest of it. And so against his better judgment, he creates a Facebook account to friend people because now he has to be friendly with other parents. That's what I had to do. Um, but he hasn't set down his security settings properly, which means that a malicious hacker, here we are, you thought they all wore hoodies, they don't, they wear top hats and have long curly moustaches. A malicious hacker is able to find information using open source intelligence about where this guy sends his kids to school. And then he doesn't target the CFO, he targets the school's website. Because school websites typically aren't well protected, they don't have big security teams, maybe they're using a version of WordPress which hasn't been patched, a plugin hasn't been updated, and the bad guy is able to exploit vulnerabilities found on the website to plant and upload a malicious booby-trapped Adobe PDF file on it. Now all he has to do is get people to open that PDF file. Well, that's not that difficult because what he can do is he can create an email. He can forge email headers to make it look as though he is the head teacher of the school. He emails the CFO at his office address with some kind of school announcement. I get these emails all the time. You know, there's been an outbreak of rickets or something, or so and so's lost his PE kit. Will you look for it? Or there's a school music recital or something like that urging, you know, a little bit of social engineering, urging the recipient to click on the link to find more. And the link in the email really does go to the school's website. So even if the user is suspicious and hovers his mouse over the link, when he sees that it goes to the real school's website, he's going to trust it. And when he does that, he opens the PDF file, which then installs a Trojan horse or some other kind of malware, maybe it's ransomware, onto the computer in his office. And that is what we call technically a kaboom situation. Malware has made its way into the organization. The user has been duped by something which was specifically crafted with the intention of hitting his organization. And now the hacker is free to maybe extort money or steal information from those computers, all because 
a data file, a PDF in this case, came through, which was booby trapped and had something malicious hidden inside it. So that's the kind of thing which is happening with targeted attacks, doesn't always involve school websites, but these sort of tricks are what are happening all the time. And that's the present problem. So I'm going to hand over now uh, to Dr. Simon Wiseman, who's going to tell you a little bit more uh, about Deep Secure's solution to this problem. Thank you, Graham. That was really good. Um, OK, thanks, folks. Um, so Graham's given us a, a, a great history lesson there and perhaps a glimpse of a dystopian future, one where we're forever plagued by viruses, Trojan horses and other malware. Um, you know, with wily attackers with curly moustaches continuously outfoxing antivirus defences. Uh, but uh, I don't think we need to go in that direction. Uh, and to explain why that is, I'm going to go back to basics. First, I'll take a look at how those defences work and see why they're failing in a bit more detail. Uh, then I'm going to explain how Deep Secure does something different, uh, something which doesn't keep failing and might just help us uh, avoid sinking into the mire. Uh, then I'll talk about why I think the approach we're taking is the way the industry has to evolve to tackle the problem. OK, so let's take a look at antivirus. What's it trying to do? It's trying to spot viruses, Trojan horses, ransomware, generally any data that does bad things. Uh, not just executables, but documents too, like Graham was saying there. That's just malware in general. Now, having spotted some, it blocks our access to it so we don't get hurt. There we go. Simple. Now, the big question behind that is, how does it know whether some data is good or bad? Uh, well, now, a couple of strategies have been tried over the years. So let's start by taking a look at the first. It's what Dr. Solomon did when all this started. Um, the theory is pretty simple. You assemble a list of all the viruses and other bad data that's out there. When some data arrives, you look to see if it's on that list. If it is, then you've got yourself something bad. Uh, you block access to it and save the day. Uh, if it's not on the list, well, it must be good, so you allow the access. Now, the trouble is that doesn't always work. The bad guys don't stand still. They keep working to invent new viruses and the like. And these bad guys are a little bit ungentlemanly. They don't play fair in that they don't tell the vendor about their new malware. What they do is they unleash it on the world intent on doing damage. So this new malware turns up on somebody's system. Their antivirus defenses kick in, grab the data, look it up on the naughty list, but it's new malware. The antivirus vendor doesn't know about it, so it's not on the list. If it's not on the list, it's deemed safe. So the user's allowed to access it, and then boom, you know, the user's now a, a victim. So that's it, they're a victim of new malware, a zero day attack. And everyone else thinks, oh, that's tough on them. But hey, uh, it's gonna take a miracle to stop a zero day. Just glad it wasn't me, yeah? Well, I don't know about you guys, but I don't reckon that's good enough. Um, I want some protection that works. And if a miracle's what it takes, then so be it. Uh, but actually, you know, I don't think it comes to that. We just need some new thinking and some smart engineering. So hold on to that thought because we'll be coming back to it later. So someone gets hit by new malware. What happens next? Well, now's the time when the antivirus vendor springs into action. Uh, they investigate what happened. They track down the new malware. They add it to the naughty list. Then that updated list is distributed around their customers. And thankfully not by floppy disk these days. And uh, once the customers uh, have got the update in place, they're protected from this new malware. It's no longer a zero day. It's just another entry on that ever-growing list of known malware. Now, it's obviously uh, important that the vendor works fast. As soon as that zero day shows its face, you know, uh, until they've worked out what the new malware looks like, added it to the list, got the updated list distributed, their other customers are vulnerable. And the longer they take, the more time the virus or malware has to spread around. But hang on, let's think, how often is this going to happen, right? How likely is it that you as a customer will be the first one hit by some new malware? Well, I mean, surely, you know, creating malware must take a bit of effort. The attacker's got to write some clever code and test it out. And all the antivirus vendors have got to do is shove it on a list. So the attacker must work hard while the vendor has a fairly relaxed time. 
uh, perhaps interspersed by short periods of frenetic activity when something new does hit. But it can't go wrong too often, you know, even if there is a lot of attackers out there. But that's just not the picture that Graham painted. You know, we are being deluged by new malware. Failures are so common that they only make the headlines if they result in like really huge damage. So what's going on? Well, unfortunately for us, the bad guys are smart. They've developed tools that generate new malware from old in no time and with no effort. And these tools are a malware factory. They can churn out new malware at, at, at such a rate that every one of the attacker's targets gets a different version of it. And the antivirus vendor now doesn't have just one incident to, uh, to investigate. They have one for every customer and they just get swamped. Now, it's not terminal. Uh, it, it's just like the attacker, the, the antivirus vendor tool is up for the job. They build tools which help with the analysis and they put smarts into their antivirus scanners that identify new malware that's similar to one that's already on the list. And this, uh, this evens up the fight. Uh, but the vendor is still definitely on the wrong foot here, continually playing catch up. And you know, genuinely new malware still gets through. So that's where we are with that first antivirus strategy, scanning the data, looking for viruses and other bad data, continually battling with the attackers who try to evade detection. Okay. And so this is now where we take a look at the second strategy. So what happened? Folks realized that trying to detect bad data is really hard and they look for someone else and they turn their attention to detecting bad behavior instead. Now, the thing about most of these different malware samples that the factories are churning out is that they all end up doing the same thing. So this strategy says, don't look at the data, look at what it does. If it's a program, run it. If it's a document, open it up and then see what happens. If it does no harm, then it isn't malware. If it tries something bad, then it is malware. So now, now it's a bit dangerous to try this at home, right? But running some suspect program just to see if it's malware, it's a bit like dropping a bottle of oily liquid on the floor to see if it's nitroglycerin. You know, you soon know one way or the other, right? But there's no going back if it turns out to be harmful. So rather than test the suspect data in your computer system, the vendor sets up a special contained environment called a sandbox and tests it in that. If it blows up, the sandbox contains the damage. Uh, if it doesn't blow up, the data is passed on to your system for you to use. And this, this is great. This sounds much better than maintaining the antivirus naughty list. Uh, you don't have to worry about every instance of some malware being different because every instance does the same bad thing at the end of the day. And we spot that in, in the sandbox. Ah, oh, so that's great. Don't you think that sounds really good? Uh, we sure have got a winner now. You know, this has got to be it. It doesn't matter how many variants of some malware get created. We just spot them as soon as they do something bad. And it even works against zero days because they'll do something we understand to be bad and that we'll notice. So pretty good. Sandboxing's got to be the ultimate in antivirus defense, don't you think? But hold on a minute. Uh, don't get carried away. Let's just think about what the bad guys will make of all this. Well, as it happened, it didn't take them long to realize that they just had to avoid detection. Uh, and it was simply a matter of changing their malware's behavior dependent on where it's running. So if the malware finds itself running in a sandbox, then it simply does nothing bad. It lies low. It just looks like some harmless program or innocent document. Uh, and that way it gets let in. But if it's not in the sandbox, then it must have reached its target. And now it can unleash help and it's boom again. The, the user is, is another victim. So all the bad guys have to do is add some code to their malware that checks where it is running. And it turns out this is surprisingly easy. It's very difficult to make the sandbox environment exactly the same as the target, which is you know, generally a desktop machine with a user sat in front of it. So, so for one thing, the sandbox doesn't have a user who is wiggling the mouse uh, while they play the Trojanized game or read the infected document. And, and things like this tell the malware where it is. Now, the, uh, the vendor of the sandboxing solution is obviously going to be a little bit disappointed when the attacker evades detection. When it happens, they have to go in and work out what the attacker did to figure out it was in a sandbox. Then they can fix up the sandbox to be a little bit more realistic and close that loophole down. The attacker is thwarted once more. 
but the attacker just responds by using some other technique for working out where they are. And this means we're back in another arms race. The uh, attacker evades detection, the vendor improves detection. You know, it's rinse and repeat. But, but on each cycle, you don't, don't forget, some customer loses out because they're the victim of the zero day that gets past the detection. So where does this leave us now? Uh, we've got two strategies to choose from, but both keep failing to stop bad data causing damage. Um, I think you know, we're actually relying on the protection afforded by being in a herd. We hope that the new malware that evades detection will hit someone else first, and that the vendor will be able to improve their defenses before that attack reaches us. Hmm, not good. I put it to you that it's time we had a third strategy, uh, and this time we need one that can't be evaded. Um, so, what's clear is, and what, what history teaches us, is that detection doesn't work. You know, years of experience with antivirus scanning and sandboxing, uh, sandboxing has uh, demonstrated that. Uh, the bad guys keep getting in, and customers keep getting hurt. What we need is, is not better detection, but a defense that doesn't rely on detection. And that way, the bad guys have nothing to evade. So, you need to think of fresh. Viruses, Trojan horses, whatever. They all live in the data we fetch or get given. But what we want is the information that the data carries. Let me explain what I mean a little bit there. The, the data is the bits and bytes that a computer manipulates. The information is the, the writing and the pictures and the formula that you see and manipulate in the applications you work with. This slide deck we're showing, you know, it's, it's pictures and text that you see. You're not seeing the bytes that encode it into a PowerPoint file. If we broke out into slideshow mode, uh, out of the slideshow mode and started editing, you know, you'd see the shapes and the lines all linked together into slides, and you can manipulate these and change wording or add a picture. And but how all that stuff gets represented in the file, we don't know, and, and frankly, don't care. We just want the information. The data isn't interesting. You know, it's hidden from you. But it is where the malware lives. It, it might be a dangerous macro tucked into the back of a slide or some code added to the end of the file. It isn't something we see, and it certainly isn't anything we want. It's in the data. And, that's, and this is what gives us a way out of this detection spiral of doom. That malware lives in the data, we don't want the data, we just want the information. So how about this for a plan? Let's transform the way the information is carried, replacing the data provided by some new data that we know to be safe. What this means is we throw away the original data with any malware in it. Now, obviously, if we throw the data away and lose the information with it, uh, it's not much use. We, you know, we protect ourselves, but don't get what we really want. So before we throw the data away, uh, we need to extract and keep the information. Then after throwing the data away, we need to build some new data to carry the information on its way to the user. This new data has been built by us. We, uh, you know, not by the attacker, um, we know it's not got any malware in it. It's, it's clean. You know, we can trust it. And we've transformed the way the information is carried, but preserved the information that the user needs. So the user, you know, what do they see? What do they think? Well, they don't know anything's happened. They just see the text and the graphics and the formulas that they're interested in. The, the, they're not, you know, the fact that the data is different doesn't affect them. So they have it. It's a third strategy, transformation. Right? Data that's fetched or received is always thrown away, just in case it contains a virus or malware. The information it carries is kept, and new clean data is built to deliver that information. But the, re you know, the really good bit, though, it's th is that the data is always thrown away, whether it's riddled with malware or perfectly safe. There's no attempt to distinguish good from bad. No decision is being made about whether to let the data in. There's nothing for the, the attacker to try to evade. Old malware is discarded, new malware is discarded, data that isn't malware is discarded. So, so think about what this means. Uh, there's no detection, so there's no evasion. So there's no arms race. And there's no zero days because the data that's delivered is always clean, tidy, and safe. Oh, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Okay. Yeah, okay, pretty good. But there is one thing that transformation can't fix, and that is software. It's just not technically possible to transform software to remove bad functionality. Now, most ordinary users don't need to receive software. 
but the systems they use certainly need software updates and, and they're just as problematic. And I mean, and after solar wind, everyone knows how important it is to control software updates in the software supply chain. Right? Um, so you need a system for checking updates. Transformation can be used to protect the update workflow there, but you need things like scanning and sandboxing uh, to make sure that the new software isn't malware and behaves properly. So, what do you reckon of that? Doesn't sound, don't, don't you think transformation sounds good as a theory? I, uh, you know, I reckon it does. Uh, wouldn't it be fantastic if it was real? Well, well folks, it is. Uh, it, it, it works, it's real. Transformation is what Deep Secure does. Uh, we call it threat removal. Um, we call it threat removal because it doesn't just reduce the threat by defeating known malware, it removes the threat by stopping it all. It gives the bad guys no wriggle room to evade detection because there isn't any detection. And it slots into your, in, <coughs> into your existing infrastructure, bolstering up your existing defenses. I and mean, then you can put it into your email flows to ensure your users get malware-free email and attachments. Um, there's no delay. There's no quarantine for documents that are a bit suspicious. Uh, it's just business as usual. The, the information you need turns up safely in a perfectly readable, editable, searchable form that you'd expect. Or you can slot it into your web gateway, you know, so it can clean up those documents and images that you download. Again, no delay. The, the stuff just arrives in a safe form. But it's not, uh, no, it's not just good for unstructured data like documents and images. It applies to structured data like XML and JSON too. Transforming data formats like these in, you know, in web services and application workflows ensures they aren't carrying any unwanted extra. And it's, it's, it's pretty important. Now, you can deploy these defenses either on-prem or in the cloud. You can have them as physical appliances, virtual appliances. And, and if you're building a, you know, modern apps in the cloud, you can also build threat removal straight into your app just by using our cloud service. For example, you've uh, built a customer portal and you need to make sure the documents they send you are safe to handle. Um, just hook our service into the app for workflow and the job's done. You just, you know, you get safe data every time. Um, so we've got a re real alternative to detection here, transformation, uh, brought to you by Deep Secure's Threat Removal. Uh, and it can slot into existing infrastructure to upgrade your security posture without you having to rip it all up and start again. Now, so with, with this available, what does antivirus defenses of the future look like? Well, for the, for the data you handle on a day-to-day -day basis, it's got to be transformation. You need to stop malware getting in and you need to stop risking those zero days. But it complements other defenses, especially when it comes to handling software updates. So I think threat removal is you know, the future of antivirus because it works. Um, but I'm sure you need to be convinced. Uh, and the way for you to do that is to try it. Um, if you're using detection today, you, 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 you probably have some samples of malware that, you, that have been detected and blocked. And you're likely to have samples that got past the detection and had to be hunted down by your SecOps team. So grab these and head to deepsecure.com slash try. And here you'll find a web portal that lets you upload those samples. If it's a document-based malware, you'll get back a cleaned up copy. Um, but please try it with the freshest malware you have. You know, we won't have seen it before, but because we don't try to detect it, we'll still defeat it. So give it a go. Well, okay, so thanks for listening. Uh, I'm gonna hand back to John now for the closing ceremony. Fantastic stuff. <clears throat> wow, what, a, what an interesting session um, on, um, on a different approach to uh, antivirus and to the evolution of antivirus. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen, both of you. Uh, and now, obviously, we've got uh, some questions coming in and time is reasonably tight. So I'm just going to pick up on a few of them straight away if I can. Uh, I can see straight off one that we probably need to, um, to, to, uh, to kick off with. Um, some of you have probably noticed if you've seen the press this week that um, Deep Secure was acquired by Forcepoint. Um, it was Tuesday, I think it was the publicly announced. Uh, so I guess a reasonable question here, Simon, is um, we're all excited about this. What does it mean for threat removal? What does it mean for Deep Secure and, and our customers and prospects going forward? Uh, well, um, we're all really, really excited at the prospect. Um, 
it gives us just a, such a fantastic opportunity to get threat removal to a wider audience. You know, that, that force point of such a strong position in the States and, and elsewhere. It gives us all those off ramps we could, you know, we could dream of. So the technology, you know, it's, it's going to get a really good home there. Uh, the, the, you know, here we are in the UK developing this great stuff, and we've got a fantastic, if you like, partner now mothership to to take it to the world. Brilliant! Can't wait. Okay, good stuff. Excellent, excellent. Now let's see what our audience made of uh, of the content of the session. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of questions here. Okay, uh, first off, a question from David. David, thank you very much indeed. David asks, what file types can you actually transform then using threat removal? So um, I guess that's for me, yeah. Um, so at the moment, we, we handle all the common file types that you would use every day you know, in your mail and web, and that the attackers use every day. Uh, so there are, there are types we don't handle. Um, because they're not, you know, not so common, what have you? But we do all the main ones, uh, and, and I think that's what matters. It's, do we cover what the bad guys are doing for most people? Now, as time goes on, we're just going to expand that portfolio, and of course, after you know, yes, you know, the recent news, we, we'll be able to accelerate that. Okay, cool, cool. But in terms of uh, of the uh, the bad guys' favourite uh, avenues of attack, so, uh, yes. so, so, so Office PDF. documents, PDF, imagery. Uh, and all the weird file formats that go with that are, are all handled. So everything you'd expect is there. Great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. Okay, um, I've got a question here from Melissa. Melissa, thank you very much. Melissa says, uh, she says, you say you extract the good and valid information from the data and throw the data away. Uh, you know, how do you know what's what's valid information? How how are you sure you're you're, you're getting everything that, that that the user needs? What, what's going on there? Um, so the, the the what we do is 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 get all of the information out uh, because we don't know whether the user will find it helpful or, not, or interesting or not. So we preserve all the information except when it's um, uh, obviously you know, dangerous executable type type data. And we, we so macros, for example, arbitrary macros, you can't tell what they do. You really don't want to risk them too dangerous so that they wouldn't be brought in. So we explicitly don't bring in things that we know are, are dangerous. Um, but we don't bring in anything that we don't understand or don't realize what it's, what, what it's all about. So bringing in everything that's safe that the user would see. Uh, so if it's accessible through the user interface, then we know it's a potential that some user would want it. So other than the active stuff like macros, you know, anything that's, that's, that the user could see, we would preserve. So all the revision text and graphics, but all the revision marking and comments in Word documents, for example, the metadata that you have in, in documents, things like that. Yeah. Okay, excellent, thank you. And in fact, your, your macros comment is, is relevant to another question here from Bizan. Bizan wants to know how, you know, how we deal with macros insofar as uh, obviously, there are there are a bit of a bet noir, aren't they, when it comes to the cybersecurity industry? That there there are people who who demand to have them, shall we say? Yeah, yeah. And, and macros are the really scary things in 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 the world, if you like. And uh, you know, if you don't need them, don't have them. Is the uh, basic advice. So in the first instance, we will block them because they're just too dangerous. And then it's a question of thinking, well. Actually, sometimes I, I want them and they're okay for me. And in particular, if it's like a corporate template with macros in, then actually you've already got the macro. Uh, so if someone sends you a macro enabled document, but you've already got the macro, then that's different. You know, you're not bringing it in, you've got it already. So you must be okay. Um, the, the more dangerous case is where someone you don't know or don't trust creates a macro and wants you to run it. That's when you should be scared. And um, we help you take other measures to contain that risk and, and make sure that you've got it well controlled. So it, you, you've got to treat them really carefully uh, is the answer. Okay, okay. That's great. Uh, and I think, Faison, hopefully that, that's answered your question too. Um, uh, and I've got, we've got time for, for one more question. This one is from, from Rolf. Thank you, Rolf. Rolf asks about password protected content. Uh, Simon, again for you, I think. Um, 
what, 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 what's the stance on that? Well, um, you know, password protected content defeats all sorts and you know, defeats detection for sure because you can't see inside it. But it also defeats um, transformation because it doesn't understand what's there. So we can't transform password protected files. So what we do instead is we we wait until the user says they want it and is able to provide the password. Uh, and at that point, we can step in, use the password they supply to unwrap the data, transform it wrap it back up again, and then the user can have it. So we, we delay the uh, transformation process when it's password protected like that. But, okay. but we don't want the user to have it until it has been transformed, because it's a, it's a well-known ploy way of getting um, malware through to, to password yeah, protected. Of course. of course, but but you're still able to deliver it protected effectively, which is which is yeah. you know, well, what the purpose of the exercise is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Good stuff, Rolf. I hope that answers your question. Uh, I think we've got time for one more, actually. And this one is from Kathy. Kathy, I think that's how you say it. Kathy. So Kathy asks about the she's asking about the user experience here. So um, I guess files are being, you know, your stuff is being transformed. You know, <laughs> how does it look and feel afterwards? Yeah. Well, um, uh, but the user experience, in effect, the user doesn't have an experience. They just don't <laughs> see anything different. So if someone sends them a Word document, a, a Word document turns up and it's got the same text and graphics, they can edit it the same way. Uh, if it's a PowerPoint, it, you know, slides work and transitions fire. The, the, the user just doesn't see any difference. That, and the only thing they don't see is, an, a, is a long delay while some detection mechanism takes its time to sort it out. So the UX is, 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 is really good because it's invisible security. It's good invisible security. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so thank you, um, Faisan, Cathy, David, Melissa, everybody involved with that uh, little session there. Really appreciate your questions. Um, and there are a, a whole rough more I can see, which I think we're probably out of time now to address. Yes, we're just over running a fraction. Um, so what we'll do is get back, fear not, on each of the questions you've asked uh, off the back of today's session. Now, yeah, obviously, we're bringing the session to a close now, uh, and I'd like to thank Graham uh, and Simon for a really insightful uh, webcast today. Please take the opportunity to find out more. You can visit our website or contact us via email um, to get some more background on our views on the future of antivirus. Uh, how transformation is the way to escape being in that that uh, a never-ending cycle of, of, of detection and uh, uh, patching and detection and patching and so forth. You can contact us via email. And I must also doff my cap here to uh, Graham's co-hosted podcast, Smashing Security, uh, where episode 231, for those of you who want to seek it out, uh, includes a, a really neat interview with Simon, where he talks about essentially how he came up with the idea of transformation and threat removal um, and how he worked on, on making it a reality. So check that, that podcast out because it's well worth a listen. OK, I think then uh, it only remains for me to thank the gentleman again, uh, to thank you for attending. I hope you've enjoyed the session and found it interesting. Uh, and please do get in touch with us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day and, and goodbye from us all. Goodbye now. Bye. Bye.